Heavenly Father, as we take up our study this morning, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would guide and direct and help us bring these um, truths together into a clear picture. We ask a blessing upon this day's activities and a blessing upon the production of this message that goes out over the internet. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was looking for these untitled notes. Okay, I have them, of course. But the ones I was using, the first time I used them, which was about a week ago, I assume, um, I think I probably would have marked where I stopped. Did anyone that has these notes mark where we stopped? Because I know we didn't get all the way through it. I know we got so far, and then I also jumped to the end to make a point when I was finishing, but... Um, I guess on these untitled notes, let's at least, let's go, I just, I'll comment on a couple things in, on page two and onward, and we'll just try to flow Daniel's into it. Version. Pardon me? Version. No, that this is, this is a, like a secondary handout with Daniel's last vision, but it's an untitled. Yeah, the decree which we just go for. Yeah, yeah. And I, I started going through that, and uh, I read most of Testimonies, Volume 5. And then on page 2, we started into oh, yeah. uh, the Great Controversy 451. Mm -hmm. um, and on, on the top of page 3, that last paragraph of Great Controversy 451, at least one, there's several things in there. One of the things that I wanted to note, and probably did in that presentation, is the Third sentence from the bo bottom, speaking of Rome, it says, All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given to her. So we're saying in this history, based upon Isaiah 23, that Rome is in hiding. She's forgotten for 70 years as the days of one king, the 70 years being a symbol of the period of time that Babylon ruled the world, literal Babylon, and that 70 years typifies the 1260 years that spiritual Babylon ruled the world. And in Isaiah 23, the whore that is typified by Tyre, the Catholic Church, is forgotten for the days of one king, and at the end of that kingdom, that one king, she's going to come and commit fornication with all the kings of the earth. We looked at that, Isaiah 23, <clears throat> and I'm saying that that 70-year period that she's forgotten typifies the time period of a kingdom and the kingdom that she is forgotten during is the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy the United States and whether people understand it or not whether people are stupid enough to say that we need to apologize for the Pope to the Pope for the things that we've said about the papacy if they're that spiritually dead to make those claims um, Sister White doesn't agree. She's saying that <clears throat> the papacy is simply waiting for vantage ground and then she's going to strike. Um, so she's watching what's going on, even if she's off in Samaria, Samaria, as Jezebel was in the story of Elijah, even if she's forgotten. Um, and the Protestant world in that paragraph has forgotten who she is. Um, next passage from Great Controversy Three, 572 um, is the passage where, among other things, Sister White makes the case that even though we are in a time period of great intellectual light, that this is still just as favorable for the papacy to make her move as it was um, in a great period of spiritual darkness. Um, and in the th middle paragraph there of Great Controversy 572, is there's some there's some paragraphs in the Great Controversy that have sentences or, or thoughts that are so profound, um, and in this particular, these three paragraphs, there's more than one, but one of them that is always stuck in my mind as of s supreme importance is the second paragraph, page three of your notes from Great Controversy 572, the second paragraph there, the last three sentences 
four sentences. It says, they must have some means of quieting their consciences, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God, which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. And this is the sentence that's so profound when you realize what she's saying. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. The secret of the papal power is that it's designed to reach two classes of persons. And as you work through this history here, and um, of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, there's, I, I, I hope we're not getting confused. I know we're not, but I, just to make my point. Good Pope, conservative, bad Pope, liberal. Trump, conservative, Putin, liberal. Republicans, conservative, Democrat, liberal. It doesn't mean that either one of those classes is good. Okay, they're both bad. This is Pharisees, Sadducees. They come together at the cross to crucify Christ. God's people are typified in that scenario as Christ. You don't want to be in either category. Okay, But Sister White is saying when it comes to the wicked, because at the end, in verse 45 of Daniel 11, the world is divided into two classes. The seas are the people of the world, and the glorious holy mountain is God's church. But the seas... The, the wicked of the world, they're divided into two general classes, Pharisees and Sadducees. Or, as Sister White would say, those who would be saved by their merits, Pharisees, and those that would be saved in their sins, Sadducees. Here is the secret of her power. So when it comes to those that are under Rome's banner, Inspiration, both Bible and the spirit of prophecy, breaks it down into a, 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 a dual type of character. And there's more. I mean, if you're going to go to the cross, it wasn't simply Pharisees and Sadducees. You had zealots and you had um, um, publicans. And there's, a, there's other classes there. But the two primary classes that the whole world gets divided into under the umbrella of Rome is Pharisees and Sadducees, conservatives and liberals. And so this, these three lines here are emphasizing this truth, and it's saying that this is the secret of Rome's power. It, and Rome, when it is going to conquer, it works both sides against the middle. And you can't get drawn into the conservative logic of Trump, because he's just as dangerous as the, the communists, um, philosophy of a Bernie Sanders. Neither one of them is going to get you eternal life. Okay, But Satan, Rome, uses both of these influence to lead to the, to the cross where God's people can be crucified. Um, okay, uh, and there's more to these. I don't know exactly how far we got through last time, but page four, let's look at that. Uh, this was where we we spoke about the Jesuits. Um, just absolutely amazing. You know, I had an, an email dialogue here over this weekend from somebody that has a ministry we used to work with that is convinced we're in darkness, and um, I'm convinced that he's in darkness. And he, he was unwilling to address any of the, the things that I raised. Okay, how do you explain the over 20 false predictions on November 9th? And you're still promoting that. Um, had nothing to say about that. Um, how do you explain that you are now promoting the Jesuit order? Nothing to say about that. And his whole argument was, is that I gave the mantle to Parminder. And this is why he's going to carry on in this path. Okay, and I'm saying... You think that's going to hold, and I said this, you think that's going to hold up in the judgment that because Jeff Piminger made a mistake uh, that you're allowed to follow all this nonsense that Parminder and Tesser are teaching? 
because it isn't about me here. Sister White is very clear uh, the, that the Jesuit order is the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. When Parminder and Tess are promoting the Jesuit order, it's not about that Jeff Pippinger made a mistake. It's that Ellen White made a mistake here in her comments on the Jesuit order. Okay, forget me. Um, this is a rejection of the spirit of prophecy, which is the last deception of Satan and fits right in to the time period of the Omega movement. Um, so... Uh, that we, I, I know last time we touched on the Jesuits. Okay, page five. I may, I'm going to assume maybe we didn't get this far. And then we'll start here again. One of the points we want to make is that at the Sunday law that fu is fulfilled by Daniel 11, verse 41, uh, that there's a threefold union. And the threefold union is definitely... Um, something that uh, Parminder and Tessa's movement rejects, and therefore it's something that we need to understand correctly. And Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is all about these three powers. Uh, in verse 40, you got the king of the south, there's the dragon. You got the king of the north, there's the beast. You got the chariot, ships, and horsemen, which is the false prophet. Um, then you have, in verse 41, you have an illustration of Edom, Moab, and Ammon, which is the threefold union that the people are escaping from. So verse 40 and 41, it's about the threefold union. Verses 42 and 43 is about the king of the north, the papacy, conquering the dragon power, the world, Egypt. Um, the whole story is about the threefold union, and they've attempted to turn it into all about the dragon, exclusively the dragon. So, Sister White says, in Signs of the Time, June 12, 1893, when the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for His people, that they might worship Him according to the dictates of their own conscience, the land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread, the land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ, when that land, through its legislators, abjured the principles of Protestantism, and give countenance to Romish apostasy in tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. Okay, so at the Sunday law, one of the things that happened is the final work of the man of sin is revealed. So at the Sunday law is where you're going to see Satan personate Christ. Okay, and that's Daniel eleven forty one. That's one of the things that takes place. But we, in this presentation, not too long ago, we took time to show, um, to argue that the main reason there's a doubling with the midnight cry is because the history of the midnight cry probably should have had one more way mark here took the time to make it nice and neat and tidy, and I'm going to wreck it. No, I won't wreck it. I might wreck it, but I'll do it this way. Um, I'll put another way mark over here. At the midnight cry, there is a Sunday law, the first in a series of Sunday laws. And this is the Sunday law of Daniel 1141. Therefore, from here, at the time of the end, in 1989, from here to here is the history of verse 40. But if you're going to expand the time of the end in verse 40 to 1798, then this is, this is 1798 and 1989, which you can do if you're just looking at verse 40. Then this is the history of Isaiah 23. This is the 70 years that Rome's forgotten from here to here. And what we're pointing out here is, um, 
Satan's marvelous work, okay? Satan's work. But what we, what we put in place previously is that this history here, the image of the beast testing time in the United States, is repeated here in the image of the beast testing time for the world. We looked at Revelation 13 and verse 11. The United States speaks as a dragon. Then it goes to the world and forces the world to set up an image of the beast. We looked at several things. Therefore, this satanic work that takes place here, what's going to happen? It's got to be one here. And we put this in, the place, in place in the past, right? There's a threefold union here we're going to look at in a moment. What's got to happen here? Threefold. threefold union. But this threefold union is in the history of the United States, this one. And this threefold union is in the history of the world. This is the history of the sixth kingdom. This is the history of the seventh kingdom. Um, so I'm just reminding us of something that not too long ago we put in place in this study on purpose, so that when we start taking these lines from Daniel 11 and plugging them in, we have justification for the way marks that we're putting in place. Are you all with me? Okay, um, next quote on page 5. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness, when Protestantism shall reach her hands across the gulf, reach what? Stretch. Shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hand of spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution, so when's the Constitution get repudiated? At the Sunday law. law. So when's the Constitution get repudiated? Right here and right here. Okay, it's a, it's a progressive development. Here's the, the total end of the road. But right here, there's a threefold union. Yes? So here, there has to be a threefold union. And the Constitution's an issue here and here. Was the Constitution an issue here? What is here? What is this? 9-11. Um, was the Constitution an issue there? Yes. Patriot Act. What about back at this way, Mark, 1996? Was the Constitution an issue there? How? By uniting church. Well, by the, essentially uniting church and state with the Pope and, 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 and Reagan. Uh, oh, that'd be back here. Oh, what'd you say was? I, I just threw, I was just checking you. I'm going to put 1798 slash 1989 for the time of the end. So what you're saying, yeah, in, in 1984, when, Ro when Reagan appointed an ambassador to the Vatican, that's an attack on the Constitution. Okay, but I was pointing here to 1996. Is there a problem for the Constitution in 1996 when things get formalized? What gets formalized in 1996? Well, you have the, the Time of the End magazine, the message of the hour gets formalized. Bin Laden declares a jihad in 1996. Um, you have Fox News starting, the voice of the false prophet. You have the Eternal World Television Network, the voice of the beast starting. And you have uh, the, the confederacy of Time, Warner, and CNN. CNN, all of those together, the voice of the dragon. But what else happened in 1996 in terms of formalizing? No one remembers? You, you all remember, what, what, how did the Constitution get attacked at 9-11? The, the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act. No, it was in 96, wasn't it? I don't know when the 
coal was, but it, the Patriot Acts enforced in, at 9-11. When was the Patriot Act written? 1996. So you've got a constitutional issue here in 1984, a constitutional issue at the formalization waymark, 96, a constitutional issue, constitutional issue, constitutional issue at all these waymarks. And it's just, it's getting bigger and bigger as you go, up, as you go down the line of history. Okay, so I'm still on the second page, or second paragraph. When under the influence of this threefold union, our sh country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government. And what's Protestant and Republican government speaking to? The two horns. Yes. She's repudiated everything about being the two-horned beast of Republicanism and Protestantism. And what has she become? A dragon. She's speaking as a dragon. But what are her two horns at that point? Oh, military. military and economic. It's no longer republicanism and Protestantism. It's military and economic. And that's exactly what you see Trump exercising. It's military and economic might on planet Earth today. And shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Here's the second witness of Satan's work here. Okay, the other quote said, the final work of the man of sin, that's the papacy. But Sister White tells us that the man of sin, the papacy, is Satan's representative upon earth. And there's a connection between Satan's personation of Christ and the final workings of the man of sin. What's the connection? Maybe you don't know it, but... I'm going to say the connection is right here. It's Fatima. The final working of the man of sin is based upon the prophecy of Fatima. That's their guiding light. They're not going by the Bible and spirit of prophecy. They're going on the prophecy of Fatima. And they understand that at the end of the world, before a thousand years of peace, at the end of the world, the third world war is going to begin and what will be the type of warfare that they predict with Fatima? Nuclear war. They predict nuclear war in which some countries, they say, will be eliminated, destroyed fully. And they say that it's going to be very short nuclear war. And the war ends at the second coming of Christ. And the second coming of Christ is Christ appearing in heaven and the whole world sees it, and the Third World War stops. And how do they know the, the papacy? How do they know that this is really Christ when he returns? Because they say he's going to call fire down from heaven inside of men, and this will prove that he's Jesus. Okay, so this is the personation of Christ by Satan the marvelous working of Satan, but it's also the final movements of the man of sin. They're directly connected, and they get underway at the Sunday law. And I'm saying that what connects them is this prophecy of Fatima about the black pope and the white pope, the good pope, the bad pope, and all the things that are connected. And I'm saying that it's illustrated in Daniel's last vision, and we're supposed to recognize it in the structure of Daniel 11:40. To 45. Okay, um, Seventh day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 911. We like that, right? We're, we got a, a 7 and a 911 there. The time is coming when Satan will work miracles right in your sight, claiming that he is Christ. And if your feet are not firmly established upon the truth of God, then you will be led away from your foundation. Those people that left this movement were led away from their foundation. The only safety for you is to search the truth as for hidden treasure, as for hid treasure. Dig for truth as you would for treasure in the earth and present the word of God, the Bible, before your heavenly Father and say, enlighten me. Teach me what is truth. Really? It's not supposed to be that you look at the Bible and then go to some religious leader and ask them how they understand it? How, 
dig for the truth as f you would for treasures in the earth and present the word of God, the Bible, before your heavenly Father and say, enlighten me, teach me what is truth. You should store the mind, you should store the mind with the word of God, for you may be separated and placed where you will not have the privilege of meeting with the children of God. You think that's possible? Mm -hmm. In this modern world, have, have you seen the pictures of the, of the people getting separated because of the coronavirus? Okay, that's just over the virus. Um, it can happen even in the model, modern world that you can get separated. None need be deceived. The law of God is as sacred as his throne, and by it every man who cometh into the world is to be judged. There is no other standard by which to test character. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now shall the case be decided according to the word of God, or shall man's pretensions be credited? Man's pretensions, or the word of God here, is how Sister White is commenting on Isaiah 8.20. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. But we took some time here we recently to show that the argument of Isaiah 8.20 is about whether you're listening to a dead person or not. Okay, it, it, the, the argument out there that Jeff Pippinger is dead, don't listen to him, is out there because it's a prophetic waymark. And in terms of leadership of this movement or leadership of the Omega movement, you have to determine whether you're listening to a dead person or not. And the Bible teaches that the way you determine whether they're dead or alive is if they speak not according to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, it is because there is no light in them. And that's the dead people. Christ, says Christ, by their fruit ye shall know them. If those through whom cures are performed are disposed on account of these manifestations to excuse their neglect of the law of God and continue in disobedience, though they have power to any and every extent, it does not follow that they have the great power of God. Amen. On the contrary, it is the miracle working power of the great deceiver. Amen. Now, remember, I've been doing a lot of talking as we proceed through here. This is the third paragraph in this passage, but it begins with the time is coming when Satan will work miracles in your sight, claiming that he is Christ. When is that time? It's, it's right up here, okay? But it's also right here, okay? And so at this point in time, there's going to be a, an art. You're going to have you and I are going to have to decide whether these miracles are genuine or not. So what does that tell you? That there are miracles taking place at this time, both yeah. true and false, because now it becomes a test on determining if it's genuine or not. And it's your only safety is a thus saith the Lord. And if you've been trained to say that a thus saith the Lord is spiritualism, you're being set up to drink in further deception. On the contrary, it is the miracle working power of the great deceiver. He is a transgressor of the moral law and employs every device that he can, that he can master to blind men to its true character. We are warned in the last days he will work with signs and lying wonders. And he will continue these wonders until the close of probation that he may point to them as evidence that he is an angel of light and not of darkness. So how long is he allowed to do this? To the close of probation. So is there a close of probation here? Yes, there's another close of probation here. This is the close of probation for the Sixth Kingdom of Bible Prophecy and for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So this is the close of probation for mankind and the whole world. Um, and right now, I want to throw in the mix. I'm not, I'm not going to address it at this point. But these two histories that are repeating, we could call this the history of the Nethanims, right? 
And we could call this the history of the Levites. But where are we living right now? We're in the history of the priests. And God's judgment begins at the house of God. It's progressive. And so these characteristics here that we're seeing in the history of the Levites and the Nethanims, they're playing out in our history too. At a, at a different level, just the, the same as that this history of the United States is a different level than the history of the world. So what does that mean in terms of miracles? Right now, there should be true and false miracles taking place that we're going to be tested by. Um, and I'm not worried about, about emphasizing the miracles. I'm saying that Satan is allowed to do these miracles for how long? Till the close of probation. So the miracles that we're going to get confronted with that we have to decide, I'm going to argue they come to an end here. The miracles that the Levites are going to have to be tested by is going to come to an end right here. And the miracles that the world is going to have to be judging come to an end right here. Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. The church may appear to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible or ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. The remnant that purify their souls by obeying the truth gather strength from the trying process, exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. So, in this history here, you have a separation. And how do you spell separation? AR. Mm -hmm. yeah. Separation. So you're going to have a separation process going on here. A testing process. And that's what we've been saying about the image of the beast testing time in the past, image of the beast testing time for the world. But in this time period, there's two classes being separate, separated. What? I said that's what we've been saying for 25 years. Yeah, and so we're, we are in a... Now we're in a separating process here for the priest. It's, it's taking place. Um, and while that separation process is taking place, what appears to happen? Okay, so this is what church... Well, yeah, but I'll, my, I'll give you my answer so you get my point. This is the Christian church. It looks like Christianity is going to fall in this history. What church looks like it's going to fall here? Adventism. And by and large, the majority of it is going to fall. But all it is is the chaff being separated from the wheat. What church is going to fall, appear to fall over here? The movement. Okay. Movement, Adventism, Christianity. And uh, the, the, the people that come through this entire process are definitely the 144,000. Um, but how does... Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. How did Adventism begin? It began as a movement. It's going to end as a movement. Um, okay, so the fact that on September 7th we went from 10,000 down to 300, that's an agreement with what the testimony of this history, this history, and our history. This is the history of the Levites. We're in the history of the priests. This is the history of the Nethanims. Yeah, and the Millerites, the, the temple cleansings in the Millerites speak to that too. Page six. The people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countenance to popery, the measure of their guilt will be full. <coughs> And national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of this apostasy will be national ruin. Okay, so national ruin. There's going to be national ruin over here. 
not to the extent here. This is the, the sixth kingdom ends here. But this is the beginning of the seventh kingdom. It's a transition. This is the history of a dictatorship, of a civil war, of God's escalating judgments. Yes, it's image of the beast testing time in our history. Our land is in jeopardy. The time is drawing on when the, its legislators shall so abjure the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Romish apostasy. The people for whom God has so marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will by a, a national act give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome and thus arouse the tyranny which only waits for a touch to start again into cruelty and despotism. With rapid steps, we are already approaching this period. So it's a period of time, and it's only waiting for a touch, and, and, and despotism is going to return. What's despotism? Despotism is a word for dictatorship. So here, in, from, in this history here, Sister White has a quote where she's talking about the threefold union, and she says, under one head, the dictator in this history is the Pope of Rome. But this is the seventh kingdom, history of the Nethanims, history of the world. Here, a dictatorship is going to come into the United States. And I'm not really being critical of anything that Trump's doing right now in terms of this coronavirus. I, you know, I, I, I assume he's doing all the right things. But the reality of it is, if it continued to escalate, and I'm only using this as an example, I'm not making a prediction, that's pretty close to moving into a dictatorship when you start saying, okay, no one traveling from that country can fly out or in. You're starting to put restrictions, travel restrictions across the board in different places. Um, you're starting to take what you would need to take, I believe. You need to take some control from the top if it got out of hand. And that's just on the idea of a uh, pandemic. Throw in a nuclear strike, um, throw in some tornadoes, unexpected tornadoes, uh, and there's all the justification you would need for despotism, particularly when Sister White tells us that a civil war is going to take place again. Why would a civil war take place? Do you see two classes of people in the United States? Uh, <laughs> wait, till, wait till they they don't allow Bernie Sanders to be their presidential uh, uh, nominee and watch the civil war that takes place among the Democrats at their convention. Um, okay, anyway, that, no, that's just political c conjecture. We don't want to go there. America, where the greatest light from heaven has been shining upon the people, can become the greatest place of darkness, peril and darkness because the people do not continue to practice the truth and walk in the light. Okay, this place is going to become the greatest darkness. The unrivaled mercies and blessings of God have been showered upon our nation. It has been a land of liberty and the glory of the whole earth. From 1798 to the Sunday law, this sixth kingdom is the glorious land. But when you get to here and they've thrown off the constitution and surrendered to the papacy, it's no longer the glory of the whole earth. It's the end of the glorious land. It's no longer glorious. But instead of returning gratitude to God, instead of honoring God and his law, the professed Christians of America have become leavened with pride and covetousness and self-sufficiency. The time has come when judgment is fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. But the Lord's arm is not shortened that it cannot save, and his ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. The people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, what is Protestantism. There's only one definition. It's to protest Rome. This crazy idea of Parminder and Tess that we need to apologize to the Pope 
is surrendering Protestantism. A Protestant is to protest Rome. And so they have their seminars out teaching uh, their minions how to be less conservative, how to be less of a Protestant. Okay, they're going to surrender Protestantism and give countenance to popery, lifting up the Jesuit order. The measure of their guilt will be full and national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of this apostasy will be national ruin. The voices of those under the altar who have been slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus are still saying, It is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they've made void thy law. Where it says in quotation marks, It is time for thee to work, O Lord. It is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they've made void thy law. What book in the Bible does that come from? I don't need chapter and verse, but what book in the Bible does that come from? The, the last verse there, it is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Psalms. That's the book of Psalms. Okay, so what I want you to see here is Sister White has just combined two passages. She says, the voices of those under the altar who have been slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus are still saying, where does that come from? Revelation 6, 9-11. Revelation 6, 9-11. And what they're saying, and we can read Revelation 6, 9-11, is they've made void thy law. And, of course, we still ex ex respect um, the authority of the spirit of prophecy, unlike some. And the spirit of prophecy says the health laws are as binding as the Ten Commandments. So if you reject the laws of health, you're breaking the Ten Commandments. But if you teach others, there's a difference. If you break the health laws, you're breaking the Ten Commandments. But if you teach others to do that very thing, then you're more than breaking them. You're making them void. You're teaching people that that law is no longer valid. Okay, For me to teach you that it's okay to eat pork is to make void the health law. For you to eat bacon on your own initiative is sin on your part. Okay, So there's a difference I want you to see here in this quote it's saying they've made void the law of God and Sister White's clear that dress reform is a part of health reform. Therefore, dress reform is as binding as the Ten Commandments. So when you teach the sisters that you must dress like a man or you're going to receive the mark of the beast, you've just made void God's law. Okay, and, it's, and at that point in time, then there's a cry that comes from Revelation 6, 9-11. And when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given ev unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest a little, yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren sh that should be killed as they were, should be finished. Fulfilled. Fulfilled. Thank you. So Sister White here in this quote has just tied together the making void of the law of God with those under the altar. And that, if you go to Revelation 18, we've looked a little bit at Revelation 18 in terms of the burning of modern Babylon. Verse 4. It says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. You can take those two verses and, and clearly bring spirit of prophecy quotes to put it at the Sunday law. The come out of her, my people, is Daniel 11, verse 41. Edom, Moab, and Ammon escaped the hand of the papacy at this point in time. Therefore, this also applies over here. There's a call to come out of her. And who's getting called out here? The Levites. 
Okay, the Nethanim's getting called out here. But it goes on to say in verse 6 what Babylon's reward is. It says, verse 5 says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Babylon's sins are full right here. Okay, the United States cup is full right here, and so is Babylon, modern Babylon, the threefold union. And he's going to punish Babylon all the way along in her final work. And over here, the conclusion of her punishment is she gets burned with fire. So it's a progressive destruction of Babylon. But he's going to say in verse 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double under her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled to her double. Time well, it's going to be at all of them, but the point is, is that the doubling is, is she's now going to be judged for persecuting God's people. This is the second group of martyrs in this history. The first group is the martyrs of the 1260 years that were under the altar saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, that is now not judge. Okay, so once you have this in place, as the way Mark, that this is where she's getting the double judgment for the blood that's being spilled in this history... And remember, we looked at it yesterday from Daniel 11, that there is a purging process in verses 32 to 35 of Daniel 11, where there's a trying process going on here where blood is spilled. Um, once you have this in place, then you can back this back here. There's a persecution process that's going on during the history of the Levites. And then you can back it into our history as well. But it, it's... I don't know if lesser is the way to say it, but it's lesser, okay? Um, this is the seventh kingdom. This is the sixth kingdom. This is the movement of the 144,000. In the 17th century, thousands of pastors were expelled from their positions. The people were forbidden on pain of heavy fines, imprisonments, and banishment to attend any religious meetings except such as were sanctioned by the church. Those faithful souls who could not refrain, refrain from gathering to worship God were compelled to meet in dark alleys, in obscure garrets, and at some seasons in the woods at midnight. In the sheltering depths of the forest, a temple of God's own building, those scattered and persecuted children of the Lord assembled to pour out their souls in prayer and praise. But despite all their precautions, many suffered for their faith. The jails were crowded, families were broken up, many were banished to foreign lands. Yet God was with his people, and persecution could not prevail to silence their testimony. Many were driven across the ocean to America, and here laid the foundation of civil and religious liberty, which have become the bulwark and glory of this country which have been the bulwark and glory of this country. What's the glory of the glorious land? Okay, uh, yes, that's the right answer, but in this last sentence, what is it? Civil and religious liberty that are incorporated into the Constitution. Okay, so what's civil and religious in, in a prophetic? How? Protestantism and publicanism, what's another way would, we would express that prophetically? Church and state. Church and state. Separating those two entities. What was the church they, didn't, they wanted to protect against? The Catholic Church. What was the state? The kings of Europe. The kings of Europe. They were protesting the kings of Europe as much as they were protesting the Pope of Rome. And it just... It, Sometimes it just frustrates me. You flip on the news, and the news is talking about the royals in England. Who cares about the royals in England? It is, is as much an abomination as is the Catholic Church. The Constitution was written to oppose that kind of foolishness as much as it was to oppose Catholicism. Anyway... As the Sabbath becomes a special point of controversy throughout Christendom, is that true? That the Sabbath is going to be the special point of controversy? Or is there not going to be any Sunday law? Yeah. It's just absolute insanity 
that people that were once professing to be in this movement have bought into that kind of darkness. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of, su of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. The, the, even the logic of the Omega movement saying that, no, it isn't going to be a Sunday law. It's going to be a stand for minority rights, for feminism, for homosexual rights. That isn't going to make you the object of universal execration. It's going to make you on the side of the majority. It's, it's totally a denial of just the basic principle of this thought. It's, it's a total denial of Christendom, Christendom because when you realize that we're supposed to reflect Christ, he never did any of that. Never got involved with politics. Never, ever. And so for them to say we're in a new dispensation, you can say that all you want, but our, our main goal would be to, to reflect Christ and his character and what he did when he was on the earth. Amen. Okay. Maranatha 187. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union. This is the threefold union at the Sunday Law. One great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces, and shall give their power and strength to the beast. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. So where she's quoting from here is Revelation 17. Who in Revelation 17 have one mind? It's the ten kings. And what are the ten kings going to do? They're going to give their power and strength to the beast. Who is the beast? It's modern Rome. And I'm just wanting to make sure that we see that these ten kings, it says, thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power. It's the ten kings that are going to do the hands-on bloodbath at the end. They're going to be directed by Jezebel, but they're the ones that are going to do the dirty work. And there's a place where Sister White says, the United States leads out in the New World and Rome in the Old World. So even the persecution is divided into Old World and New World. And the Old World, it's, it's NATO. It's still the kings over there that she's um, directing. Notice the page number. Notice the page number. Maranatha 187. <laughs> okay. Great Controversy 439, thus while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. And that's where I was answering to Brown yesterday that the dragon moves through history. And what I'm saying is a struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north begins here. Here in 1798, the king of the south, he's already been in history since the, the disintegration of Alexander the Great's kingdom. But here it comes into our focus in terms of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And the king of the south here begins as atheistic France, ultimately becomes Russia. <clears throat> and I'm saying that the, the final climax of the king of the south struggle ends right here on December 25th, uh, 2021. And that this is one of the storylines and the king of the south in this history is simply another manifestation of the dragon. You could call it the dragon, you can call it the king of the south, and here he's going to transcend into the ten kings, the United Nations, which is, once again, just a manifestation of the dragon. Testimonies to Ministers, page 38. Notice the number, 38. <laughs> What's 38? <laughs> the, yeah, I think we have to be careful about the numbers. I mean, the numbers are correct, but we can't just always grab a random number and say because it's used as a symbol somewhere else that this automatically plugs in. Perhaps this does, but 38 means what? It's the 
It's a rise. Okay, in Deuteronomy, in the 38th year, they're told to arise and take the promised land. And in the New Testament, Jesus tells the paraplytic that's been paralyzed for 38 years, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And in 1838, Josiah Litch sets forth a prediction that is going to lift up as an ensign the message of the Millerites that when it's fulfilled in 1840, 200,000 people join their movement. So 38 becomes a symbol of lifting up. But here, page 38 of Testimonies to Ministers, it says, Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So you might argue that right here, the ten kings agree to give their kingdom to the beast, and they arise as the persecuting power. If you want to put testimonies to ministers, page 38 in there. But uh, I can do it as well as anyone, whether it's always valid, I don't know. Okay, we have to move. We have four minutes to move through these final quotes, and we're going to give it our best shot. The next one is Testimonies, to Minis testimonies Volume 7. Let it never be forgotten that these institutions are to cooperate with the ministry of the delegates of heaven. They are among the, the, they are among the agencies represented by f the angels flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people with a loud voice. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. From them is to go forth the terrible denunciation. Uh, this is one, I'm, yeah, we have to deal with this. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she hath made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. They are represented by the third angel that followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God. And in a large degree through our publishing houses is to be accomplished the work of the other angel who comes down from heaven with great power and who lightens the earth with his glory. Okay, so now what, what Parminder attempted to do, one of the things he attempted to do was deny that the angel of Revelation 18 came down here at 9-11. And at that point, the second angel's message is sounded, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, okay? And he put all his effort to place it over here at the Sunday Law. And it goes at the Sunday Law. That's my point. It goes at the Sunday Law, but if it goes at the Sunday Law, where else does it go? It goes at the midnight cry, and it also goes here, and for lots of reasons. Um, this is where the judgment process of the priests begins. This is where the judgment process of the Levites begins. This is where the judgment process of the Nethanims begins. Okay, so he wants to destroy the whole understanding of who the priests are, because he's not a religious movement. You don't need priests if you're a political movement. You need dictators. Okay, so he wants to destroy that. And I'm wanting to make sure that we see that this expression, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, gets plugged in here, here, and here. Okay. Um, solemn is the responsibility that rests upon our houses of publication. Those who conduct these institutions, those who edit the periodicals and prepare the books, standing as they do in the light of God's purpose, are called to give warning to the world, are held by, a, by God accountable for the souls of their fellow men. To them, as well as the ministers of the word, applies the message given by God to his prophet of old. Son of man, I have set thee as a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked of his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this passage. If you go back up to the first paragraph, she's talking about the message of Revelation 14, the hour of his judgment has come, but she's talking about the people that give that message. 
second sentence of the first paragraph, they are among the agencies represented by the angel flying in the midst of heaven. And next paragraph, from them is to go forth the terrible denunciation, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Okay, so God's people, in the next paragraph, are represented by the third angel. Okay, the angels represent God's people, and they're the ones giving this message. And it is accurate to place Babylon is fallen, is fallen right here. This is the third angel's message uh, in its present truth context. But Sister White has just taken Babylon is fallen, is fallen in this passage. And in that fifth paragraph where she says solemn is the responsibility. Where does she quote from in Ezekiel? Ezekiel 33, 7 and 8. And she says, Son of man, I've set thee a watchman. When are the watchmen set? Are they set here? Are they set here? Or are they set here? They're set at 9-11. Why are they set at 9-11? What's your, what's your point of reference for that? Jeremiah 6. Go to Jeremiah 6. What I'm doing here is I'm saying that we'll go ahead and we'll stand on the truth. We're not going to change the way marks. And the truth in this movement always was, is that at 9-11, you were called to go to the old pass. And verse 16 of Jeremiah 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old pass, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Here, why did we go back to the old past? Because Islam arrived in history. And how are you going to apply, how are you going to prove that the third woe of Islam arrived in history? You have to go back here. And you have two witnesses here of first woe, second woe is Islam. Second witness of this, first woe, second woe is Islam. It, the understanding of Islam was established in the pioneer movement. And it gives us the two witnesses that we need to see the third woe right here. This is the old past. And in this history here, this is when these tables come back into this history. This is the return to the old past. And if you do, you're going to find rest to your souls. So what's the rest? It's the refreshing. It's the beginning of the sprinkling of the latter rain. All the lines that come in here to prove that the latter rain begins to sprinkle at 9-11. But what does verse 17 say? It says, and also I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. The watchmen are set right here. And according to this passage we're looking at in the spirit of prophecy, what is part of the watchman's message? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And of course, that's verse 2 and 3 of Revelation 18. When the angel comes down and the earth is lightened with his glory, He's giving this message here. Uh, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Okay. Want to continue on here. Want to finish these, even though I'm a little bit over time. Never did this message apply with greater force than it applies today. More and more the world is setting at not the claims of God. Men have become bold in transgression. In the world and in the religious world. Men have become bold in transgression. The wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the measure of their iniquity. This earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. The substitutions of the laws of men for the laws, law of God, the exaltation by mere, merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath, nothing to do with feminism or homosexuality, of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. He will arise in his majesty to shake terribly the earth. He will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity, and the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. When he arises, in his majesty to shake terribly the earth. When is that? 
That's right here. He's going to punish now. The seven last plagues are his punishment. You follow that? Yes? So when does he rise? When does he stand up here? When this substitution becomes universal. What substitution? Back up to the next sentence. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. It's the end of the road. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. He will arise in his majesty to shake terribly the earth. This quote here you want because it's showing here a Sunday law. This is the universal Sunday law. This is the Sunday law of Daniel 11 verse 41. But this is the Sunday law of 321. This is Sunday law of 538. This is the one that begins the pro process. And we want to see that in the history of the image of the beast testing time in the United States, it begins with the Sunday law. It ends with the Sunday law. And in the history of the image of the beast of the world, it begins with the Sunday law and it ends with the Sunday law. Okay, that quote you need for that one so that you can uphold these two periods of time being parallel. Which, whether you remember it or not, is one of the five points that we're arguing in Daniel's last vision that we have to come to understand. That quote isn't over. It says, the great conflict that Satan created in the heavenly courts is soon, very soon, to be forever decided. Soon all the inhabitants of the earth will have taken sides, either for or against the government of heaven. Now as never before, Satan is exercising his deceiving power to mislead and destroy every unguarded soul. She just remember the paragraph before she's talking about the universal Sunday law. And now she's talking about the whole world's taken sides. This is Daniel 1145. The world is divided between the glorious holy mountain and the seas. And Revelation tells us the seas is the people of the world. Okay, that's right here. That's what she's speaking about. We are called upon to arouse the people for, to prepare for the great issues before them. We must give warning to those who are standing on the very brink of ruin. God's people are to put forth every power in combating Satan's falsehood and pulling down his strongholds. To every human being in the wide world who will give heed, we are to make plain the principles at stake in the great controversy, principles upon which hangs the eternal destiny of the soul. To the people far and near, we are to bring home the question, are you following the great apostate in disobedience to God's law, or are you following the Son of God who declared, I have kept my Father's commandments? Okay, um... Next quote we got to put in place. It's about the midnight cry in the Millerite history. Midnight cry in the Millerite history. In Millerite history, second angel arrived on August, on April 19th, 1844. And then on August 15th, 1844, the midnight cry joined the second angel. Okay, you need to see a joining of angels. And you can see that in early writings. She says, I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to earth, and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth, to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. So what's she speaking about here? Revelation 18, right? The message of the third angel is going to 9-11, and then she sees another mighty angel going to join with it. That's Revelation 18. Amen? Amen? Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The message of the fall of Babylon is given by the second angel is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. This would be the corruptions because Babylon had fallen is here, here, and here. 
This is the corruptions that have come into the Christian church. This is the corruptions that come into Adventism. What are we supposed to be identifying? The corruptions that have come into this movement. Okay, and they began in 2014. The Omega movement begins in 2014. Um, the message of the followers, the work of this angel comes in at the right time to join the last work of the third angel as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them and they united fearlessly to proclaim the third angel's message. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven. And I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere come out of her, my people. Does here that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues for her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. Calling the Nethanims out. Calling the Levites out. Calling the priests out. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. This message seemed to be an addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second message in 1844. The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints and they fearlessly gave the last warning, solemn warning, proclaiming the fall of Babylon and calling upon God's people to come out of her that they might escape her fearful doom. That's early writings 277, Life Sketches 429 says, I've had a precious, I've had precious opportunities to obtain an experience. I've had an experience in the first, second, and third angels' messages. The angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon the people living in the last days of Earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels. For they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven, men and women enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth. Proclaim these three messages in their order. Those angels represent the work God's people to do. John saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. That work is the voice of the people of God proclaiming a message of warning to the world. Right here. The people of God are now proclaiming a message of warning. Right here. They're going to proclaim a message of warning. Right here. A message of, of warning. Two more quotes. The first and second angels' messages were given in 1843 and 44 and were now under the proclamation of the third, but all three messages are still to be proclaimed. There cannot be a third without a first and a second and the second. These messages we are to give to the world in publications, in discourses, showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. The first, second, and third angels' messages are all linked together. Okay, so we have the third angels' message coming through history here. And here, the angel of Revelation 18 joins it. We have a warning message coming to here. And here, it's going to be, other angels are going to join it. It's going to be empowered. We have a message going through here. And here, other angels are going to join it. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And it's been the, the focus of Satan's attack. And in closing here, going to Daniel's last vision, I want to point out five points of logic that I'm arguing we need to understand to rightly put together Daniel's last vision. One of them is that history repeats. If you don't believe, if you believe as Parminder and Tess teach, then you do not believe that history repeats. You believe the history of the Old Testament is a, a history unto itself. It has no bearing upon our history. You believe that the history of the New Testament has no bearing on our history. You believe that the history of Ellen White has no bearing on our history. So to be in the movement of the 144,000 and to rightly understand Daniel's last vision, you have to believe that history repeats, especially Millerite history. Um, and and we dealt with that. The second point is, is that we have to approach Daniel's last vision from the perspective that Rome establishes the vision, not Donald Trump. That's where we got off course. Um, 
And we have to understand that Daniel's last vision, the primary emphasis is, is what it's about God's people, what shall befall God's people at the end of the world. And the fourth point is we have to understand the time of the end in order to put these lines together. And the fifth point is that we have to understand Abraham's prophecy that there are three judgments that are going to take place. Judgment upon God's people. Judgment upon the United States, the country where God's people were placed, Egypt, in the time period of Moses, and judgment upon the Amorites, the world, the Ten Kings, um, which will be judged with the beast because they get married into a marriage relationship because she's going to commit fornication with these kings. So that's where we're at, and we'll continue this in our next presentation. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we see the signs of the times fulfilling around us on planet Earth. We see that your movement has been purged to a great extent, and we're trusting now that you have um, reached the level to where you're going to raise this movement up as a mighty army, as illustrated repeatedly in the scriptures. We ask that we can be among that number that carries forward this work to your glory and your honor. And that what we have to do, that you would give us a, a clear discernment of the message and our work, that we might do it effectively and efficiently. We ask a blessing upon today's efforts by each of us, and a blessing upon this presentation as it goes out over the internet. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.